Welcome to Manhua Fury. Manhua starts with a bright, sunny afternoon. Our main lead, Rose, held a pile of laundry, stealing glances at her husband, who beckoned her to come and see something. It was their baby's bed, and Rose marveled at its beauty, affirming that it would be a while before their little one arrived. In that joyful moment, she glanced at her stomach and asked the baby if it was pleased with the new bed. To her husband, she playfully responded that the baby was indeed happy with the cozy crib. As he stole glances at her, he mumbled words of love, assuring her that soon they would find their happiness. Sometime later, Rose gave birth to their child, hopeful for their future happiness. But suddenly, things took a turn for the worse. In the quiet of the night within the Imperial Palace, Rose, with a trembling voice and tearful eyes, declared her desire to leave. Devastated, her husband tried to speak, but Rose cut him off, stating she didn't want to hear his declarations of love or his actions supposedly done for her sake. With tears streaming down her face, she declared her disgust for it all, her words echoing through the palace hallway. Moments later, in her husband's study room, he pondered how his wife could utter such words reflecting on the challenging times they had faced. Just when he thought the storm had passed, a dreadful incident occurred. A palace servant rushed in, announcing a fire, initially thought to have no casualties. However, the dreadful truth emerged. The imperial prince was caught in the blaze. Rose's husband, the emperor, widened his eyes in shock. The servant continued revealing that the First Empress, upon hearing the news, jumped to fire in a desperate attempt to find the prince. Disheartened, tears welled up in the Emperor's eyes as he stood before the Inferno, shouting, Rose. He tried to rush into the fire, but servants held him back, urging him not to go. With fury in his eyes, he insisted they release him. The second Imperial Prince assured him they were doing their best to rescue the First Empress and the First Prince, pleading for him to remain calm. The second empress, appearing concerned but hiding an evil glint, emphasized the urgency of His Majesty's safety, hinting at the vacancy of the imperial crown. The emperor was left speechless. Later, the imperial palace plunged into chaos orchestrated by the emperor himself. He handed a letter to a servant, instructing the recruitment of as many mercenaries as possible, shrouded in secrecy. The mercenaries assembled, ready to carry out the king's orders. This vendetta was the emperor's retribution against those who caused the first empress to suffer. Before the heart-wrenching events unfolded, the emperor organized an emergency meeting, attended by nobles and families alike, each pondering the significance of the gathering. Murmurs and whispers circulated among the attendees, suggesting that the meeting might be connected to the recent fire incident. Speculations arose about the Emperor's intentions to execute everyone involved under the maximum possible sentence, dismissing the incident as a mere accident. Suddenly, the second Imperial Prince burst into the room, urgently declaring that everyone should run as armed men were. His words trailed off as a sword was thrust into him, leaving everyone bewildered. Horror struck when they realized that the Emperor himself led the armed men. The second empress cradled her lifeless son, tears welling up in her eyes and her voice trembling as she asked the emperor how he could. The emperor, with rage in his voice, approached her, questioning if she thought he wouldn't notice who was truly behind the arson. As the empress recoiled in horror, the emperor asserted that since she killed Rose, he killed her son in satisfying revenge, regret he hadn't removed them all beforehand. He plunged the sword into her, disheartened and musing that if only he had realized it sooner, he wouldn't have lost Rose. With that, he walked towards the flames, muttering that he was coming to her side now. It was all a dream. Rose woke her husband from his deep slumber and as his eyes opened, she inquired about his deep sleep. Her husband, wide-eyed and bewildered, mumbled Rose's name, questioning what had happened. Rose looked at him in surprise, and he gently brushed his hand against her cheek, gazing into her eyes. Still stunned, Rose asked what could be wrong. In his thoughts, her husband wondered if they were still alive, and he asked Rose if it was really her. 
With joy, Rose confirmed that it was indeed her. Overwhelmed with emotion, he pulled her into a tight embrace, tears streaming down his face, pondering if this could possibly be happening. Just as Rose pulled away and asked what was happening, her husband swiftly kissed her passionately, confessing how much he missed her and urging her to confess her love. Rose, still perplexed, affirmed her love for him. He gazed at her with tears streaming down his face, urging her to say it again, and she did. He then took her feet and began to kiss them, leaving Rose stunned calling out his name, Alec, and stating that something was definitely wrong with him. Moments later, outside the inn, Rose urged Alec to hurry as they walked, and he assured her that he was fine and that nothing was wrong. Rose glanced at him, explaining that they weren't going to see the doctor but insisted they visit her dad, as Alec was acting strangely. Alec, looking at her, replied that he understood and held her hand firmly. As he tried to articulate what had happened, he mused about how God had given them a second chance. Suddenly, he told Rose to hold on, and she asked what was wrong. Gazing at her, Alec remarked on her beauty and vowed not to miss the chance this time, pledging to protect everything and expressing admiration for his wife, Rose. Rose stood there bewildered upon reaching Rose's father's place, who noticed she was there. Rose insisted that something was wrong with Alec. Chuckling, Alec explained everything that had happened, from the dreams to his unusual behavior. Rose's father, however, kicked Rose out of the house, leaving only him and Alec. Rose stood there stunned. In the room, Rose's father, sensing something deeper, asked Alec what was wrong. Hesitant, Alec confessed it wasn't anything significant, just an awfully long and unpleasant dream. He explained having other wives besides Rose and numerous children from those unions. In order to continue as the emperor, he had done something terrible. Sobbing, Alec revealed that being the emperor didn't guarantee he could protect Rose. He further explained the loss of their first child and the tragic death of their second child in a fire. Alec had chosen the path meant to protect Rose, but it ended up costing her life. Saddened, Rose's father asked if the dream still haunted Alec. Alec admitted he was, and Rose's father acknowledged the dream's likelihood of coming true. Alec, bewildered, listened as Rose's father discussed their differing statuses and hinted at the unpredictable nature of their circumstances. Inquisitive, Alec asked what Rose's father wished to say asserting that Alec needed to part ways with Rose before any such event occurred, Rose's father left Alec horrified. In his thoughts, Alec declared that he couldn't do that, refusing even if it was God's will for him to follow that path, especially if it meant losing Rose. Later that day, Alec pondered over Rose's father's words. In his thoughts, he asserted that things would be different this time because he already knew what was going to happen. He urged himself not to tolerate anything, not even the smallest mistakes. Just then, Rose noticed him and walked up to him, inquiring if he had spoken with her father. She observed his expression and asked. Her father had said something bad. Startled, Alec chuckled and assured her that her father hadn't, mentioning the nightmare he had been thinking about. Rose was stunned, and she inquired about the severity of the dream that left him feeling this way urging him to forget about it. As they strolled through the market, curiosity got the better of Rose, and she asked Alec if he found the place he slept uncomfortably. Some beautiful flowers caught her attention, and she asked Alec if they could stop by Zegna's store to get some paper flowers, mentioning that the Emperor's birthday was approaching. Alec mumbled at the sound of that, pondering about the chaos happening from time to time. A few moments later, Rose and Alec arrived at Zegna's store, startling Zegna, who was busy with a greeting. Rose, walking in, asked Zegna how she had been since they hadn't met in a while. Zegna replied, stating that it had indeed been a while and she also greeted Alec. Alec noticed her but averted his gaze, contemplating her status as the daughter of the village elder. However, Zegna's father had instructed her about Alec deeming him a good man who didn't know how to choose a woman as a wife. Zegna's father stated that he would use force 
implying that his daughter was better than the daughter of that monk, Rose, and that Zegna would be a better wife for Alec. In Alec's musings, Zegna wasn't a target in the past life, but Alec found it nauseous if she wanted to make a move now. Alec noticed a deer's head hanging on the wall and asked Rose why she had hung it there. Confused, Rose asked Alec, and he walked toward the object, asserting that he had gone hunting and made it as a betrothal gift for his father-in-law. Rose stood there stunned. Zegna chimed in, asserting that her father told her he got it from the monk, Rose's father. Rose was taken aback. Alec pressed on, inquiring if his father-in-law had given the betrothal gift back to the village elder. Zegna explained further that it had yet to be sold. Alec swiftly grabbed the deer's head and destroyed it with his pocket knife, leaving Rose and Zegna bewildered. Zegna, horrified, urged him to stop. Alec continued, asserting that if his father-in-law didn't sell it, then it didn't belong to Zegna or her father. He retorted, asking Zegna if her father would be his father-in-law. Zegna stuttered and needed more words. Rose mumbled Alec's name, wondering about his recent actions, thinking he was being too sensitive lately, and now it was getting worse, wondering if he was clearly hiding something from her. In her thoughts, she muttered that she would talk to him. During the night hour at the inn, as the couple enjoyed their meal together, Rose stated that she had something to tell Alec. Curious, Alec inquired about it, and Rose mentioned the incident at the grocery store, alluding to the betrothal gift and asking why her father gave Zegna's father the gift. Alec explained that the monk had already told him. Rose was bewildered, asking what he already knew about this and how it happened. Alec explained that the monk had delayed the payment to operate the village for months, and the village elder said he'd pay the debts at the cost of the deer's head. Alec further explained that he had already paid the remaining operation cost. Of course, the condition was to get that betrothal gift back, but Zegna's father said he wouldn't give it back, and he didn't have any intention to. Rose's expression saddened as she mumbled that she had no idea. Then Rose asserted that she would pay Alec back since he paid for the operation for free. Alec countered, asserting that there was no need, hinting that they were a married couple and that the monk was also his family. Rose agreed, and she mentioned his own family. Alec was taken aback. Rose pressed on, stating that he was beating around the bush and that he once said they were married, but he hides so many things from her. Rose urged him to speak, asserting that she wanted to know more about him. Alec felt perplexed, as he didn't expect Rose to ask him like this, as it was too soon to tell her about the Imperial family. Alec explained, asserting that his family and Travis. Rose was stunned, as Travis was the capital and it was so far away. Alec continued, stating that they were there to keep the family business going. Rose inquired about his family business. Alec explained, stating that it involved the construction of the village in the capital, fixing the walls and overseeing tillage. Alec asserted that his late father used to be in charge of it, and now his brother had taken over, but many people thought Alec would step up. In his musings, Alec mentioned that his mother was the main wife and his brother obviously couldn't accept it. His old father married a young woman and made her his wife, leaving his business to the child that she bore. Her child didn't like Alec, as he hated him so much. In the end, Alec's brother gathered support from the people who had his back and created a beneficial situation for himself, becoming the heir. Alec was a thorn in his brother's eyes, so he was sent away. Rose was stunned, recalling the first time she saw Alec when they were little. Still bewildered, she inquired if he had been sent away from Travis, his town, with no one to take care of him. Alec explained further, stating that some servants were sent, but they ran away. As no one wanted to take care of an abandoned child with no power and all his siblings hated him, not just his brother, Rose's heart was broken, and she apologized, explaining that she had asked too much. She clarified that she didn't mean to bring up that pain again, wanted to know her husband. Alec brushed his hand against her cheek, gazing into her eyes, and stated that he was fine. He affirmed that she was right to ask questions as they were a married couple and should understand each other. He asserted that they couldn't be apart, 
not even one step as she was his wife and he was her husband. At that moment, he urged her to promise not to leave him. Rose pulled him into a hug, asserting that she wouldn't leave him, and after that, they both spent a passionate moment in bed. As Rose quickly fell asleep, Alex stole glances at her, contemplating the Emperor's birthday celebration and recalled what had happened in his dream. The Emperor sent an assassin to kill him, and as a result, the village elder was swayed and killed, along with his uncle. Recalling this, Alec gazed at Rose and urged himself to keep his ground, not to make mistakes, asserting that he must protect her at any cost and that he couldn't lose anyone again. As the night hours descended, the moon illuminated the pitch-black sky. A man, his identity concealed in a hood, walked down a path but was confronted by Alec. Alec mentioned his name, Orzin, asserting that it had been a while since they met. Bewildered gave a bow, addressing him as your highness and also noting how much he had grown. Alec glared at him and stated that it had been a while since he left the palace, inquiring if something happened on his way here. Startled, Orzin asserted that there wasn't anything. Alec informed Orzen the Emperor would send an assassin in a few days, urging him to watch out. Orzen, bewildered, asked Alec how he knew about it. Alec smirked and stated that even though he was stuck in this remote village, there was a way to find out things, mentioning that he had many things to discuss with him. The next morning, as Rose woke up, she noticed Alec walking in and asked him where he went. Explained that he took a walk nearby. Rose was taken aback, and Alec asserted that it was because he couldn't sleep, asking Rose why she was up so early. Rose explained that she wanted to make it a habit. Alec got even closer to her, brushed his hand against her cheek, and inquired if she was all right. As Rose said she was fine, she suddenly threw up, bewildering Alec. Rose was stunned by her actions and apologized to Alec. Alec inquired if she had been feeling different or more tired than usual. Rose was stunned and stated that she had been feeling that way. Alec smirked and stated that he thought she was pregnant. Rose was stunned and Alec gazed at her with a smile. Earlier during Alec's encounter with Orzin, Orzin was taken aback, unable quite to fathom what Alec had been saying. He inquired about Alec's intentions. Alec continued, stating that he heard that Prime Minister Mankal was imprisoned and suggested that although things had this way, they could change. Alec urged Orzin to investigate the Prime Minister's schemes and plans, revealing his plan to turn the minister to his side. Orzin agreed, stating that Mankal's political power could be an advantage over the current empire. Alec mentioned Marquise Heaslow and Marquis Oprez as potential allies. Orzen explained that it would be advantageous if Alec married one of Marquis Oprez's daughters. Alec countered, asserting that he wasn't marrying anyone and that he had a way. Orzen was taken aback, inquiring when, and Alec stated it had been three years ago. Orzen pressed on, asserting that Imperial family members could marry other wives. Alec retorted, asserting that he would only have one wife. Orzen was taken aback, asserting that she must be great for Alec to have thought so. Back at the inn, Rose touched her stomach, pondering what she would do. Alec was startled, questioning her remark and inquiring if she was glad. Rose, with a nervous smile, responded that she was as they had been expecting this child for a while. To Rose, she couldn't believe it yet as she was becoming a mother. Alec smiled at her and stated they would see a doctor soon, also urging her to tell him if she needed anything. Rose smiled and thanked him. Alec urged her to go, and as he stood, he noticed something was a bit strange about Rose as she didn't react as he expected. Recalling his dream, Alec felt perplexed as Rose didn't react the way she did in his previous life. In her room, with her hands on her stomach, Rose pondered the new change in her life. Memories came flooding back. During the golden hour of the day, Alec and Rose sat together outside. Rose, her mind filled with worries, told Alec that there was something she would like him to know about. Rose revealed that a long time ago, when she was still a child, she was enslaved. Tears welled up in her eyes as she pondered why she felt hurt in her head. Alec, outside, 
couldn't quite fathom what had suddenly changed as everything happened, just like he remembered. Pondering why Rose's reaction was different, Alex questioned if her feelings were different now. Alec, lost in thought, ignored Orzen, who was walking with him, calling him and inquiring if he was listening. Orzen pressed on, explaining how important it was to choose a strong clan, considering Alex's only wife was a commoner. Alec countered, asserting that his wife was a slave, not a commoner. Orzen was bewildered and inquired if she had a slave background. Alec responded no and that she was enslaved. Orzen, horrified, pressed inquiring if she was the escaped enslaved person, asserting that she was a crazy woman. Alec swiftly rebuked him with a slap, asserting that he should never insult Hai's wife. Just then, Rose spotted Alec and called his name. Alec was stunned as he saw Rose. Rose, stunned by the situation, asked Alec who, a few hours later, they all sat together at a dinner table, and Orzen apologized for his sudden interference with their romantic dinner. Rose responded, stating that tomorrow is a festival period, and it would be hard to find a place to sleep. She mentioned that she didn't know they would have a guest, and they didn't have enough food. Orzen thanked her, stating that this was more than enough, and thanked her. Rose replied that it was all right, but his gaze on her caused Rose to avert her face, and Alec noted he chided Orzen, questioning how beautiful his wife must be for him to be lost in a gaze. Orzen apologized, stating that he was rude. Rose stated that it was all right. A few moments later, they finished their meal and Rose asserted that she would show Orzen to his room, leading him to a small room, explaining that it was a room for children. Orzen asked Rose if she had any children. Rose was taken aback by his question and stated that she had no child yet. Orzen apologized and stated that he had asked too many questions. Alec in his room felt perplexed, as he didn't expect Rose to take Orzen home, as he had no intention of letting them meet. Just then, Rose walked in, urging Alec to take a blanket to Orzen. Alec stated he would. Suddenly, Rose asked why he lied to her when he stated that he had met Orzen by chance and inquired about his relationship with him. Alec was stunned and in his musing, he mumbled that Rose would soon find out that he was the prince anyway and the more things from her, the less she'd trust him. At that moment, Alec's expression saddened Ida's. He asked Rose to promise him that she'll always be beside him and that she would love him always. Rose walked up to him and promised. Alec, still perplexed, muttered and hoped that, that this time things would be different, as memories of what had happened in the dream flashed through his mind. Alec turned his attention to Rose and asserted that he was the prince and that his father was Leodaz VII. His mother was the second wife of Eloise of the Castor clan, and he was their only son. Rose was stunned as she noticed that he was the kingdom prince. She inquired if Orzen was his brother, but Alec countered and asserted that Orzen was his uncle. Rose was taken aback, realizing that Orzen was a noble, and inquired what to do as he put him in a small room. Alec, still perplexed, inquired if she had anything to say or ask. Rose walked away, asserting it would be all for now and that he was the prince and she, uh... But her words trailed off as Alec rushed to her for a tight hug and stated that she promised that they would stay together forever, and he and her have been together for a while, and they are happy. Alec asserted that their status doesn't matter as they are expecting a child and urged her not to... A family. Rose agreed to it. Later that night, as Rose stood by the window side, memories came flooding back of when she was little and an enslaved person, and how the daughter of a noble mistreated her, to the extent of using her like a doormat to get to her carriage, despite the pouring rain. As Rose stood by the window, she contemplated Alec's words and his status as the prince, with tears welling up in her eyes, mumbling to herself and asking if she could keep her promise to Alec. The next day, Rose's father, the monk, visited the inn, and Rose was ecstatic to see him. At that moment, Rose's father noticed Orzen and stated it was the first time he had seen him. Rose explained, stating that Orzen was finding his relatives but didn't have their contact information, 
Orzin asserted that Rose and Alec were too kind to let him stay here. A moment later, they all got seated with meals at the table. Rose's father inquired of Orzin about his origin, as many travelers were in the village for the emperor's birth. Orzin explained that he is from Travis, and Alec noticed that Travis is the capital, also stating that it would be a hard trip to get here, which is Roland. Just as the conversation between Rose's father and Orzin went on, Alec whispered to Rose, urging her to tell her father about their child, as they were expecting. Rose was hesitant as she listened to her father's conversation with Orzin, realizing that her father overstated and was startled. Alec, however, is still waiting for Rose to voice out their pregnancy to her father. But Rose, lost in thought, pondered her father's discussion with Orzin as she wondered if her father knew about Alec as the Imperial Prince. Just then, Rose flinched, and her father noticed her, inquiring if she was all right, as she didn't look so well. At that moment, Alec stood up abruptly and stated that Rose was a bit sensitive, asserting that it was the beginning of her pregnancy and they were expecting. Rose glanced at Alex, noticing how excited he was, and Orzen, Alex's uncle, was even more bewildered. Rose's father walked up to Rose, thrilled about the news, and stated that it was wonderful and congratulated her. Orson also congratulated Rose, but had a menacing expression hiding under those smiles of his. In thought, he muttered that he hoped Rose was not thinking of using the child as a pretext for acting the part of a wife, calling her a low-born wench. Rose noticed his dreadful gaze on her and shivered. Just then, Orzen asserted that Rose should go get some rest, and at that moment, Alec took her to her room. In thought, Orzen muttered, asserting that no matter how much he scares Rose, calling her a wench, it won't make a difference as long as His Highness Alec is around her. Sometime later that day, Orzin was on the hunt for the assassin Alec, had mentioned earlier and returned with the body bound, explaining to Alec that there was only one assassin and that he was hiding exactly where Alec said he was. Alec gazed at that captured assassin and stated that now that it was clear that the Emperor was aiming his sword at him, his days of quietly living and hiding were over, and as soon as the sun rose, he and his wife would leave for the domain of Marquis Heslo. He will meet with other families that might be willing to rebel against the current emperor. Just then, Orzen offered his opinion, stating that if Alec wishes to reclaim the imperial throne, then he needs powerful noble families like the Ulfries, and asserted that an enslaved person as his only princess is incomprehensible, even if she's carrying his child. Alec turned his attention to Orzin, asking if he was countering his choice. Alec glared at him, asserting that he had made it clear that he had no intention of joining hands with Ofris, questioning Orzin if he was paying attention to what he was saying. Orzin apologized, asserting that he would refrain from speaking out in the future. Alec said to Orzin that when he is through, he should leave. As Orzen got on his horse, in thought he muttered that Alec's plan was no good and urged himself to watch what he said as Alec looked determined, or else he would find his head rolling on the ground. With that, he left. Rose, walking down the ballroom, saw Alec and called him. Alec turned to her in excitement and, with an open arm, walked up to Rose, asserting how beautiful she was, calling her his most cherished slave. Rose stood there horrified as she heard the rumor of people calling her an enslaved person and a foolish wench to think she could become a noble. At that moment, tears streamed down her face. But all this is was a dream. Rose gasped as Alec called up to her, inquiring if she was okay, as he noticed that she was drenched in a cold sweat. Rose stated that she was fine, inquiring about her dad and Orzin. Alec explained that her dad had gone to bed and Orzin had left. Rose's expression saddened as she realized that she didn't see Orzin off. Alec urged her that it was fine and stated that he had something to inform her. Rose inquired what it was, and Alec revealed that they needed to leave Laurent. Rose was bewildered and taken aback. Alec pressed on, asserting that he didn't want to leave either, and explained that the situation had turned for the worse, asserting that now was the time for him to gather influence. 
He stated they should go to Dranberg together. Rose was taken aback, asserting Dranberg was too far away and that she had never imagined ever leaving Laurent, inquiring if things were really that bad. Alec explained to her, asserting that it's not that serious, stating that there's someone there who can help him, and explained that city life might be a little strange at first. Still, be all right. He added that he had prepared a decent house for them already, and she could leave the housework to the servants. At that moment, Orzin's dreadful gaze flashed through Rose's mind. Then she said to Alec, asserting that it would be better for him to go himself. Alec was stunned by her remark and Rose pressed on, asserting that she didn't want anything and that she'd be holding him back. At that moment, Alec hugged her, asserting he wanted to take her there because she would be safer there. He inquired what the point would be if he went alone and reminded her of their promises to stay together. Rose responded, stating that she didn't want to stay apart either since they had their precious child. She added that she is worried they will really be all right when so many things are changing around her. Alec assured her that they would and asserted that he would make sure of it. At that moment, Alec pleaded for her to cheer up a little and believe in him as they go together. Alec, gazing at Rose, asserted that there is nothing more important to him than her and stated that he'll do everything he can for their happiness, no matter what it takes. And as Alec leaned even closer, as he asserted that no matter how his life turns out, he will always choose her and asserted that he would even give up his life if she trusted in his love for her. Rose chuckled and smiled, urging him not to sound that way and asserted that they should go to Dranberg together. The next morning, the couple set out their things as they prepared to leave. A few moments later, Rose put on a beautiful dress. If she should dress this way as they were going to the city, noticing that it felt strange. Just then, she spotted Alec outside and was captivated, noticing how handsome he looked, as she had never seen him dressed up like that, wondering why she got this sinking feeling. As she gazed at him and thought, she mumbled that he was finally wearing something that suited him best and noticed that he was really an aristocrat, wondering if it was okay for her to stand by him. A while later, as Rose walked to the carriage, her father called her. She was leaving now. As Rose glanced at him, she was stunned to see him, as she was worried that she wouldn't get to say goodbye before leaving and that the decision to leave was so sudden, her expression was saddened, as she stated that it felt so surreal, as she had never thought she would leave Laurent like this, and that everything felt so unfamiliar, Rose's father noticed her worried and urged her that she would adapt splendidly as long as she believed in herself since she was a brave and intelligent child. Her father added, assured her that would always lift her up to God in his prayer. Rose thanked him, and her father assured her not to worry, and that he was sure that Alec would do his best to protect her. And at that moment, Rose hugged her father tightly. A few moments later, both Rose and Alec were seated in the carriage as it began to move. At that moment, Rose glanced at her father through the window and waved goodbye to him, still unsure about this sudden change. Just then, Alec chimed in, assuring Rose that she would see him soon and everything would work out just like her father had said. Rose agreed, thinking to herself that she didn't want to be parted from Alec. Rose asked Alec if they were going directly to Dranberg, and Alec explained that it wasn't directly. Rose was taken aback. Alec clarified that it was too far to go directly, so they were heading to Patanua first to get some rest at the hotel before continuing. Rose was startled, asking what a hotel is. A while later, they arrived at a stunning hotel, and Rose's jaw dropped as she saw how beautiful the building was. Alec asked her if she liked the place. Rose responded, stating that she liked it and it looked fancy. Wondering if there were more places like this in the city, Alec glanced at her with a smile, stating that he was glad she liked it. Suddenly, someone addressed Alec as your highness, and Rose was stunned. Alec noticed that it was Marcus Heslow. Heslow asserted that it had been a long time since he last saw Alec, expressing surprise that his sagacious prince would travel so far to seek him out in these dark times. Alec thanked him for making time to meet him. 
Heslo countered, stating there was no need to thank him, and referred to Rose with an honorific. Rose was taken aback. Heslo inquired who Rose was, and Alec asserted that she was his wife, Rose. Heslo chuckled, asserting that he had heard a lot about Rose from Alec's previous messages. Heslo stretched his hand at Rose to shake her hand, and Alec interjected, urging her to hold it. Alec scowled at Heslo, inquiring if he was greeting his wife with a handshake. He urged him to conduct himself with proper etiquette towards Rose. Heslo apologized, asserting that it had been so long since he greeted a lady he took Rose's hands, pleading that she would be generous enough to overlook his discourtesy. Rose was startled as Heslo addressed her as the Imperial Highness, the Princess. Rose chuckled and stated that she was fine and that she didn't mind about it. With that, Heslo thanked Rose as he ushered them in, explaining that the restaurant was further ahead and that he was sure her highness was famished. Rose felt anxious as they were going in, musing that she had never been in a place like this and that she didn't need to become more familiar with table manners. She turned to Alec, inquiring if it would be improper for her not to eat with him, as she wasn't hungry yet, but now she wanted to rest. Alec responded, asserting that she could do as she pleased, as he would have someone accompany her to their room. Rose countered, asserting that she wanted to be alone and that she wanted to have some fresh air because she had been in the carriage for too long and now she had a headache. She urged Alec to enjoy his dinner as he gazed at her leaving, mumbling her name. Rose, with hastened footsteps, walked past a group of men and they gossiped about her dress and walking steps. Rose overheard that and was stunned, pondering how she should comport herself. She mused about her dress, questioning if it looked funny. In thought, she contemplated how she was going to compose herself as a noble. Then she clenched her dress, asserting that she had no idea whatsoever. She recalled Orzin's words, pondering that he could be right about her status, deeming it a joke that she was with Alec. Rose halted in her steps, mumbling that it was absurd to think that she would be the imperial princess. Somewhere in the restaurant, both Alec and Heslo enjoyed delicious dishes that were served on their table. Heslo inquired about Rose, and Alec explained, asserting that Rose was in her room and that she looked exhausted at the moment. Heslo responded that the situation worries him a bit, explaining that there will be a series of banquets once His Highness arrives in Dranberg, and not only that, Rose will have to attend but will also have to be the host. Heslo wondered if Rose would be able to. Alec assured Heslo that Rose would be capable, though she would face difficulties, as is the case with anything one does for the first time. With that, Alec asserted that someone would have to assist Rose and he would send a message to Diana. Some time later, Diana in her room with a maid attending to her got a letter from Alec stating that he was coming back and asked her to take care of her highness, Rose, the princess. Diana couldn't help but wonder what kind of person Rose was. Later the next morning, Alec noticed Rose sitting close to the window and lost in a gaze. He asked her if she wasn't cold as she was sitting close to the window, inquiring what she was gazing at. Rose, still lost in gaze, mumbled that she was looking at the sunrise. Alec chuckled and commented about the sunrise, deeming it too early as they left the hotel earlier enough. Just then, Rose, feeling worried, inquired when he thought they would arrive. Alec explained, asserting that it would probably be before lunchtime and that when they arrived at the mansion, she could rest. Alec continued, stating that he had things to take care of with Marquise Heslow and he would be back in the evening. Rose, with her mind clouded with worries, pondered how she would explain things to Alec, seeing herself as someone who was not suitable to stand next to him. Alec assured her that when she arrived, she would be meeting a lady from another family as she was going to assist Rose from now on. Rose was taken aback. Alec explained further, asserting that the lady was an acquaintance of his who was around Rose's age. Alec continued, stating that she is the daughter of Viscount Ventwis, who is in the shipping business and her husband, Count Rosabeth, and has ties to my mother's side of the family. Alec assured Rose that if she keeps her close, he is sure she will find it a lot easier in this unfamiliar life. Later that day, 
Rose met with Diana Rosabeth, and they both exchanged greetings. Rose bowed, greeting Diana as she introduced herself. Diana chuckled and urged Rose not to go at her, advising her to be formal. Rose, pondering how to compose herself, apologized and stated that she was not quite familiar with royal etiquette. Diana replied, explaining that it is only natural to be unfamiliar, but she should start learning now, and that's what Alec summoned her for. Rose glanced at her, agreeing to it but still nervous, pondering the aristocratic rules of etiquette, wondering if she would fit in with the nobles if she were to learn the rules of etiquette so she wouldn't embarrass Alec. Diana assured Rose that it was doable and asserted that she would show Rose every one of them, explaining that there is no one out there who is familiar with the rules from the start and that it's a learning process for everyone. Just then, Diana realized that there was much time left before Marquise Heslow's banquet and that it was an important event since it would be the first banquet ever for Rose to attend. They should start their lesson right away. Rose was taken aback as she inquired if she meant today. Later that evening, a man met with Alec and noticed that Alec was lost in thought. The man apologized for the sudden interruption of his thoughts and inquired if he could keep him company. Alec glanced at him, recalling the last time they met when Heslow had introduced him as Lawrence Hamizul, a lieutenant colonel in the army. Alec urged him to do so inquiring if there was a message from Marquis Heslow that he wished to convey to him. Lawrence explained, asserting that he didn't come here as the Marquis's personal staff, and stated that he wished to make a personal inquiry from him, asking if he would permit it. Alec asked what it was about. Lawrence inquired why he sought to join hands with the Republicans, asserting that their opposition wouldn't be more favorable to him. Alec, surprised by his statement, stated that he is gutsy just like the Marquis, as he couldn't mind his words even in his... Lawrence pressed on, stating if that was discourteous of him, and said that it was because of his wife. Alec asserted that he wanted a world where Rose could stay as his wife and a world without slavery. Later that day, Rose and Diana began the teaching of royal etiquette. Diana urged Rose to straighten her head when she placed the book, attempted it but wobbled, Diana explained, asserting that normally more books would be stacked, but for her sake, it would be limited so that it wouldn't be burdensome on Rose. She stated that this is the basic lesson taught from a young age. Diana asserted that Rose would be more able to do it, but suddenly all the books on Rose's head fell, and Diana countered her claim. Rose picked up the books, asserting that this was hard, and stated that fixing her walk was much more difficult than fixing her manners. Diana smiled at her, asserting that these were just the basics, and asked Rose if she thought it was too difficult for her to master. Rose countered, asserting that since it is something she must know, she will have to master them since she has the time to. Rose thanked Diana. A few moments later, Diana, with a smile, urged Rose to take a breather, inquiring if they could prepare first for the banquet that she will be hosting. Rose was taken aback. Diana explained, asserting that the banquet Rose will be hosting will happen after the one by Marquis Hesse Lott. But there are many things they can prepare ahead of time, such as choosing the flowers to use as decoration, deciding how many of them to use, the dress to wear and accessories to match them, and also writing the invitation for the guests. Rose, still trying to fathom the situation, asked Diana if she thought she could do all of that. Diana smiled warmly, asserting that she had her and there was nothing to worry about. She asserted that she would do her utmost to assist Rose faithfully. Rose averted her gaze, feeling glad for Diana, inquiring how she could express her gratitude. Diana smiled, asserting that there was no need, as she was only doing what was rightful, and stated that His Majesty would soon be here. Just as Alec walked in, Rose was stunned to see him. Alec walked up to them and stated that it had been a while since he saw Diana and that he didn't think he would see her today. Diana gave a bow, asserting that it truly is a long time, and stated that it is a blessing to God to see that Alec has grown to be a fine man. 
She also pleaded for forgiveness for her discourtesy of intruding so long at Alex's residence, though it was unintended. Alex smirked, stating that to think someone as intelligent as he would make such mistakes, and urged her to return home now. Rose was bewildered by Alex's remark at Diana. Diana swiftly apologized, asserting that she would withdraw now if Alec granted the permission. Rose, taken aback, interjected, asserting that Diana should have dinner with them, and it looks like Alec misunderstood her. Diana turned her attention to Rose, wishing her to get a restful evening as she must be tired and bid her farewell. Rose, stunned, watched Diana leave, and at that moment, turned her attention to Alec inquiring why he was acting so cold towards Diana as she had worked so hard all day long to help her. At that moment, Rose asserted that she was going to apologize to Diana and walked away, with Alec calling her. But she paid no heed, asserting that Diana would be of help to her. As Rose got outside, she called Diana, startling her, and apologized on behalf of Alec. Diana inquired if that was the reason Rose rushed to meet her and Rose affirmed. Diana gazed at Rose, pondering how gentle-hearted she is, muttered that Rose may not be quick-witted. Still, she's alert enough, plus Rose isn't stupid. She mumbled that Rose would have no problem living as a commoner, but at the center of high society, she would be, her musing trailed off. As Diana asserted that Rose was too naive, Rose was shocked by her claim, Diana continued, asserting that she is worried that Rose will suffer a lot of heartache in the future. Rose, still stunned by Diana's remark, inquired why she sounded that way all of a sudden. Diana explained, asserting that she would continue to be by Rose's side to teach her about proper etiquette and stated that Rose would be fine for a while. She added that someone like Rose, she will find it hard to survive in high society, and even more so as the princess. Rose stood there, bewildered. The next morning, Rose and Alec were seated together in a study room. Rose explained, asserting that Diana was trying to get a feel for what kind of person countered, asserting that Diana wasn't showing proper etiquette to her superiors, and stated that he had never imagined that Diana would behave like this. Alec assured them that the next time he sees Diana, he will give her a stern warning. Rose explained further, asserting that she doesn't think that Diana acted that way because Rose is Alec's wife. Rose continued, asserting that, at first, she thought that Diana was treating her like a fool. Nevertheless, Rose realized it wasn't the case at all, and if that were her intention, she wouldn't have said anything at all. She was trying to teach her properly about the high society of the aristocracy. With Rose urging Alec not to say anything to Diana, Alec agrees to it, asserting that he will pay more attention in the future so that problems don't arise. Rose smiled and thanked Alec for his understanding. In her musing, she pondered if Alec could resolve this kind of issue. Later that day, Diana came back to the palace and stated that she was surprised. Rose, selecting some dress, was startled, and Diana pressed on, explaining that she knew that she had spoken a little indiscreetly at their first meeting, and she didn't expect Alec, his majesty, to summon her again right away. Rose explained, asserting she was taken aback, but she couldn't prepare for the banquet on her own. She also stated that she knew Diana didn't say what she said with bad intentions. Rose continued explaining that she was sure Diana would be worried since someone like her was standing next to Alec. Since it's such an important position, her words trailed off as Diana interjected, inquiring if Rose was open to the idea of leaving His Majesty's side. Rose's eyes widened, and with a saddened expression she asserted yes, since a commoner like her, taking the role of Alec's wife, is something beyond her life station. Rose asserted that she should probably leave before she really becomes the laughing stock of high society, but wondered what would become of her baby. But her words trailed off as Diana interjected, asserting that she shouldn't say something that she doesn't believe in. Rose was stunned by her remark, and Diana pressed on, asserting that someone who's ready to leave study so hard for the etiquette lessons and prepare so much for the banquet, and added that if Rose truly wished to leave, 
than she would have left already. Rose's expression saddened as she inquired why Diana said so, asserting maybe she spent too much time already with Alec. Memories of their times together, from when they were a child to their adult stage and how they have been together, flashed through her mind, with her mind clouded with worries, mumbled that she had never thought she could stay anywhere that was beyond her station. She had never imagined a life without Alec, as she had always believed that they would be together forever. Just then, Diana urged Rose to guard her position, explaining that it wouldn't be easy with determination alone. But at this rate, even a single banquet. Difficult for her. Diana advised, asserting that she should have a strong mindset, and if people see even a single chance to look down on her, those in high society will keep biting away at her until she dies. Diana assured Rose that Alec wouldn't sit idly by while that happens, but the ensuing suffering will be entirely hers alone to bear. Just then, Diana stood up, inquiring if she had made her decision on what fabric to choose and if there weren't anything that caught her attention. She would look into it and order a beautiful dress that would be perfect for Rose. As they both gazed at a mirror close by, Diana advised, asserting that they would go with a balanced dress and show off her lovely charm. Rose chuckled, inquiring what her charm was, wondering if that could work. Diana assured Rose, asserting that she may have been a little grim before, but the important thing about her debut in high society would be her first impression. And at that moment, Diana moved closer to Rose, asserting if Rose adorns herself a little, she will shine brilliantly even among all the eminent ladies. In a lavishly decorated room, an elegantly dressed lady glanced at her maid, inquiring how stunning she looked. The maid, brimming with excitement, assured her that she looked absolutely beautiful and perfect. The lady chuckled and inquired if she was merely being kind. The maid insisted it was the truth, asserting that the lady was the most dignified and beautiful woman out there. The lady chuckled, stating that she was sure there were more outstanding ladies than she. The maid countered, asserting that everyone talks about her these days, especially with the return of the fifth prince, hinting at the possibility of the lady becoming his princess. Suddenly, the maid retracted her words, apologizing to the lady, realizing she had overstepped her station. The lady reassured the maid that it was okay, considering it a compliment, and with a smile, asserted that she didn't see anything wrong with it. Later that evening at the mansion, Alec gazed out through the window, lost in thought about Valeria Ophiris making an appearance at the banquet. Muttering about the foolishness of his past judgments, he resolved to cut ties with the Ophris family entirely. A knock interrupted his thoughts, and as he inquired about the visitor, Diana walked in. Alec averted his gaze, and Diana noticed his sulking. She stated that she needed to speak urgently, and Alec urged her to go on. Diana, hesitating, asserted that it was about Rose suggesting that he better take a look in person. Alec, curious, decided to accompany her. As they reached a closed curtain, Diana urged Rose to come out, startling Alec. Rose emerged in a stunning dress, asking Alec why she felt it was too fancy for her, and suggested a simpler design. Diana countered, urging Alec to take her side, stating that Rose looked absolutely stunning. Alec, taking Rose by the hand, kissed it, assuring her that she looked perfect. He expressed excitement about showcasing her to everyone at the banquet as his spouse was gazing at Alec, pledged to try harder to make him proud and to be a perfect noblewoman. At that moment, Rose stood frozen, memories flashing through her mind. Alec, noticing her distress, inquired if she was okay, and Rose assured him she was fine. Diana interjected, reminding Rose not to overwork herself, especially carrying a child. Rose admitted feeling a bit tired but chose to go with the fancy dress. Later that day, imperial ladies, including Valerie Ofris, gossiped about Alec, the fifth imperial prince. They discussed rumors of Alec's connection to Valerie and the promises made by the late empress to Valerie's father, Viscount o Valerie expressed anticipation for the banquet and wondered whom Alec would choose as his princess. 
A few days later, in the morning hours, Rose, with her gaze fixed on the ceiling, realized the banquet was the next day. Alec, sensing her anxiety, reassured her, expressing confidence that members of the the Imperial family would focus their attention on her. He promised that no matter what anyone said, Rose would be his one and only wife. Rose, relieved, pledged to follow Diana's plans and expressed gratitude for Diana's company. On the day of the banquet, Alec was perplexed when a maid informed him that Diana wouldn't attend due to her father's condition. Alec scowled, insisting that Diana should still attend and return to her father's residence afterward. Rose questioned Alec's decision, and Alec, noticing her, agreed to let Diana prioritize her father. Rose, smiling, hoped for a smooth event. As the Imperial banquet approached, Alec and Rose, dressed in elegant attire, arrived in a carriage. Alec called Rose, asking if they could go in. Rose, feeling nervous, recalled Diana's advice not to give anyone a chance to look down on her. With newfound courage, Rose opened the carriage door, urging Alec to introduce her as his princess. In a room, Diana sat with her father, her mind clouded with worries as she watched over him. Just then, a servant entered, inquiring about her father's well-being. Diana explained that he was feeling better due to the medicine. The servant noticed Diana's worried expression and asked if she was concerned about her royal highness, Rose. Diana asserted that she was wondering how Rose was faring at the banquet. Rose and Alec entered the banquet together. As the event unfolded, Valerie met with Ophris, and the latter thanked her for coming. Some ladies complimented Ophris on her beauty, asserting that she looked perfect as usual. Gladys Belganor, another noble lady, eagerly awaited the arrival of the princes, expressing impatience at the unnecessary people present. When the princes, including Alec, walked in with Rose, Gladys was stunned by Alex's attractiveness, Bewildered to see him with Rose, she inquired about the unfamiliar lady by his side. As the princes and Rose entered, some noble families exchanged greetings with them. Rose responded, showcasing her etiquette. However, as she conversed with nobles, Rose felt a growing nervousness, overwhelmed by the extravagant atmosphere. She urged herself to calm down and soon found her rhythm, feeling delighted with no apparent issues. In the ballroom, Gladys wondered aloud about the girl by the prince's side, unable to decipher the situation. She approached Valerie, asking if she knew, referring to the girl as the future princess. Valerie hesitated, urging Gladys to stop fooling around, and admitted she didn't know who Rose was. Gladys agreed, expressing eagerness to know more about Rose's family. By Alec's side, Rose felt hunger creeping in, Spotting a passing servant, she recalled Diana's advice on how to address servants properly. Following Diana's guidance, Rose called the servant, who promptly brought her a delicious meal. Rose and a noble lady beside her finished each other's sentences, both asserting the food's deliciousness. They laughed together, and the lady mentioned it was the first time she had met Rose. Rose pondered what to do as the conversation lengthened. Alec, Noticing Rose, was stunned to see where she was. Curious about the lady with Rose, Alec wondered if she was dangerous but soon realized she was not. The lady introduced herself as Mary Larioke and Rose lost in thought, debated whether it was appropriate to introduce herself. Remembering Diana's advice not to rush into introductions, Rose, with a smile, introduced herself as Aprosa Sethen. Later, Rose's name reached Valerie, who smirked, recalling Rose as a beautiful enslaved woman. Valerie says that when she was young, his private tutor was from that family. My tutor's surname was Catherine. Then she says my tutor was a person who stole a beautiful enslaved woman. This part ends here. Thank you for watching till the end. It took a lot of time and energy to make these kinds of videos. So please subscribe to my channel to watch more interesting Manwa stories.